there is still another way than that just indicated in which the indifference of law and force, or of notion and being, is found. In the law of motion, for example, it is necessary for motion to be broken up into the elements time and space, or again, into distance and velocity. Since motion is merely the relation of these f actors, motion, the universal, has in this way certainly distinct parts in its own self. But now these parts, time and space, or distance and velocity, do not express in themselves this origination from a single unity. They are indifferent the one to the other. Space is thought of as able to be without time, time without space, and distance at least without velocity just as their magnitudes are indifferent the one to the other, since they are not related like positive and negative, and consequently do not refer to one another by their very nature. The necessity of partition into distinct factors, then, we certainly do have here, but not the necessity of the parts as such for one another. On that account, however, that first necessity too is itself a merely delusory false necessity. For motion is not itself thought of as something simple or as bare essence, but as, from the first, divided into elements, time and space are in themselves its independent parts or its real elements, in other words, distance and velocity are modes of being, or ways of thinking, each of which can very well be without the other, and motion is consequently no more than their superficial relation, not their true nature. If it is represented as simple essence or as force, motion is no doubt gravity, but this does not contain these distinctions at all. The distinction is, then, in both cases no distinction of an inherent or essential kind. Either the universal, force, is indifferent to the division into parts, which is found in the law, or else the distinctions, the parts of the law, are indifferent to one another. Understanding, however, does have the notion of this distinction per se, just by the fact that law is in part the inner being, the inherent nature, but is at the same time something distinguished within the notion. That this distinction is thereby inner distinction is shown by the fact that law is bare and simple force, or is the notion of that distinction, and thus is a distinction of the notion. But still this inner distinction falls to begin with only within understanding, and is not yet established in the fact itself. It is thus only its own necessity to which understanding gives expression the distinction, that is to say, is one which it makes only so as at the same time to express that the distinction is not to be a distinction in the nature of the fact itself. This necessity, which is merely verbal, is thus a rehearsal of the moments which make up the cycle of necessity. They are no doubt distinct but their distinction is at the same time explicitly stated to be not a distinction of the fact itself, and consequently is itself again straightway cancelled and transcended. This process is called explanation. A law is expressed, from this its inherently universal element or ground is distinguished as force, but regarding this distinction, it is asserted that it is no distinction, rather that the ground has entirely the same constitution as the law. For example, the particular occurrence of lightning is apprehended as universal, and this universal is expressed as the law of electricity, the explanation thereupon merges the law and force as the essence of the law. This force is, then, so constituted that, when it finds expression, opposite electrical discharges appear, and these again disappear into one another. In other words, force has exactly the same constitution as law both are thus declared to be in no way distinct. The distinctions are pure universal expression or law and pure force, but both have the same content, the same constitutive character, thus the distinction between them qua distinction of content, to wit, of fact, is also again withdrawn. In this tautological process understanding, as the above shows, holds fast to the changeless unity of its object and the process takes effect solely within understanding itself, not in the object. It is an explanation that not only explains nothing, but is so plain that, while it makes as if it would say something different from what is already said, it really says nothing at all, but merely repeats the same thing over again. So far as the fact itself goes, 
this process gives rise to nothing new, the process is only of account as a process of understanding. In it, however, we now get acquainted with just what we missed in the case of the law absolute change itself, for this process, when looked at more narrowly, is directly the opposite of itself. It sets up, that is, a distinction which is not only for us no distinction, but which it itself cancels as distinction. This is the same process of change which was formerly manifested as the play of forces. In the latter we found the distinction of inciting and incited force, or force expressing itself, and force withdrawn into itself, but these were distinctions which in reality were no distinctions, and therefore were also immediately cancelled again. We have here not merely the naked unity, so that no distinction could be set up at all, the process we have is rather this, that a distinction is certainly made, but because it is no distinction, it is again superseded. Thus, then, with the process of explaining, we see the ebb and flow of change, which was formerly characteristic of the sphere of appearance, and lay outside the inner world, finding its way into the region of the supersensible itself. Our consciousness, however, has passed from the inner being as an object over to understanding on the other side, and finds the changing process there. The change is in this way not yet a process of the fact itself but rather presents itself before us as pure change, just by the content of the moments of change remaining the same. Since, however, the notion qua notion of understanding is the same as the inner nature of things, this change becomes for understanding the law of the inner world. Understanding thus learns that it is a law in the sphere of appearance for distinctions to come about which are no distinctions. In other words, it learns that what is self-same is self-repulsive, and, similarly, that the distinctions are only such as in reality are none and cancel one another, or that what is not self-same is self-attractive. Here we have a second law, whose content is the opposite of what formerly was called law, for example, the invariable and unchanging self-identical distinction, for this new law expresses rather the process of like becoming unlike, and unlike becoming like. The notion demands of the unreflective mind to bring both laws together, and become conscious of their opposition. Of course the second is also a law, an inner self-identical being, but it is rather a self-sameness of the unlike, a constancy of inconstancy. In the play of forces this law proved to be just this absolute transition and pure change, the self-same, force, split into an opposition that in the first instance appeared as a substantial independent distinction, which, however, in point of fact proved to be none. For it is the self-same which repels itself from itself, and this element repelled is in consequence essentially self-attracted, for it is the same, the distinction made, since it is none, thus cancels itself again. The distinction is hence set forth as a distinction on the part of the fact itself, or as an absolute, objective, distinction, and this distinction on the part of the fact is thus nothing but the self-same, that which has repelled itself from itself, and consequently only set up an opposition which is none. By means of this principle, the first supersensible world, the changeless kingdom of laws, the immediate ectype and copy of the world of perception, has turned round into its opposite. The law was in general, like its differences, self-identical, now, however, it is established that each side is, on the contrary, the opposite of itself. The self-identical repels itself from itself, and the self-discordant sets up to be self-same. In truth only with a determination of this kind is distinction inner distinction, or imminent distinction, when the like is unlike itself, and the unlike like itself. This second supersensible world is in this way the inverted world, and, Moreover, since one aspect is already present in the first supersensible world, the inverted form of this first. The inner being is, thereby, in its character of appearance completed. For the first supersensible world was only the immediate raising of the world of perception into the element of universality. It has its necessary counterpart in this world of perception, which still retains as its own the principle of change and alteration.
The first kingdom of laws dispenses with this principle, but receives it in the form of an inverted world. By the law of this inverted world, then, the self-same in the first world is the unlike of itself, and the unlike in the first is equally unlike to itself, or it becomes like itself. Expressed in determinate moments, this will assume the form that what by the law of the first is sweet, is, in this inner, inverted reality, sour, what is there black is here white. What, by the law of the first, was North Pole in the case of the magnet, is, in its other supersensible inner world, for example, in the Earth, South Pole, while what was there South Pole is here North Pole. Similarly, what by the first law is in the case of electricity the oxygen pole becomes in its other supersensible reality hydrogen pole, and conversely, what is there the pole of hydrogen becomes here the pole of oxygen. To take another sphere of experience, revenge on an enemy is, according to the primitive immediate law, the supreme satisfaction of injured individuality. This law, however that of standing up against one who does not treat me as a substantial self, showing him that I am a substantial being, and even doing away with him as a reality this law is transmuted by the principle of the other world into the very opposite, the reinstatement of myself as the true reality through the removal of the alien hostile being is turned into self-destruction. If now this inversion, which is brought out in the punishment of crime, is made into a law, it also is again only the law of a world which has an inverted super-sensuous world standing in antithesis to itself, where that which is despised in the former comes to honor, and that which in the former is honored meets with contempt. The punishment which, by the law of the former, disgraces a man and annihilates him, turns round in its inverted world into the pardoning grace which preserves his being and brings him to honor. Looked at on the surface, this inverted world is the antithesis of the first in the sense that it has the latter outside itself, and repels that world from itself as an inverted reality, that the one is the sphere of appearance, while the other is the inherent being, that the one is the world as it is for another, the other again the world as it is for itself. In this way, to use the previous examples, what tastes sweet is properly, or inwardly in the thing, sour or what is North Pole in the case of the actual magnet belonging to the sphere of appearance, would be, in the inner or essential being, South Pole. What is shown to be oxygen pole and electricity as a phenomenon, would be hydrogen pole in the case of electricity not failing within the sphere of appearance. Or again, an act which in appearance is a crime would in its inner nature be capable of being really good a bad act may have a good intention, Punishment is only in appearance punishment, in itself or in another world it might well be, for the criminal, a benefit. But such oppositions of inner and outer, appearance and supersensible, in the sense of two sorts of reality, are no longer to be found here. The differences repelled are not divided anew and assigned to two substances such as would support them and lend them a separate subsistence, the result of which would be that understanding would leave the inner region and fall back again on its previous position. The one aspect or substance would be once more the world of perception, where the one of those two laws would carry on its existence, and in opposition to it an inner world, just such a sensible world as the first, but in the sphere of ideas, one that could not be indicated, seen, heard, and tasted as a sensible world, and yet would be thought of as such a sensible world. But in point of fact, if the one element set up is a perceived reality, and its inherent being, as its inverted form, is at the same time a sensuously represented element, then sour, which would be the inherent nature of the sweet thing, is a real thing just as much as the latter, for example, a sour thing, black, which would be the inherent nature of white, is the actual black, the North Pole, which is the true reality of the South Pole, is the North Pole present in the same magnet, they. Oxygen pole, the inherent nature of the pole of hydrogen, is the given oxygen pole of the same voltaic pile. The actual crime, however, finds its inversion and its inherent nature qua possibility, in the intention as such, but not in a good intention, for the truth of intention is simply the deed itself. The crime, so far as its content goes, recoils upon itself, 
finds its inversion in actual punishment, this is the reconciliation of the law with the reality set up against it in crime. Finally, the actual punishment carries its inverted reality with it in such a way that it is a kind of realization of the law, whereby the activity, which the law exercises in the form of punishment, is cancelled in the process, a manner of realization through which the law, from being actively operative, becomes again quiescent and authoritative, and the conflict of individuality with it, and of it with individuality, is extinguished. From the idea, then, of inversion which constitutes the essential nature of one aspect of the supersensible world, we must dissociate the sensuous idea of keeping distinctions substantively fixed in a different element that sustains them, and this absolute notion of distinction must be set forth and apprehended purely as inner distinction, self-repulsion of the self-same as self-same, and likeness of the unlike as unlike. We have to think pure flux, opposition within opposition itself, or contradiction. For in the distinction, which is an internal distinction, the opposite is not only one of two factors if so, it would not be an opposite, but a bare existent it is the opposite of an opposite, or the other is itself directly and immediately present within it. No doubt I put the opposite here and the other, of which it is the opposite, there, that is, I place the opposite on one side, taking it by itself without the other. Just on that account, however, since I have here the opposite all by itself, it is the opposite of its own self, that is, it has in point of fact the other immediately within itself. Thus the supersensible world, which is the inverted world, has at the same time reached out beyond the other world and has in itself that other, it is to itself conscious of being inverted, to wit, it is the inverted form of itself, it is that world itself and its opposite in a single unity. Only thus is it distinction as internal distinction, or distinction per se, in other words, only thus is it in the form of infinity. By means of infinity we see law attaining the form of inherent necessity, and so realizing its complete nature, and all moments of the sphere of appearance are thereby taken up into the inner realm. That the simple and ultimate nature of law is infinity means, according to the foregoing analysis, a, that it is a self-identical element, which, however, is inherently distinction, or that it is self-sameness which repels itself from itself, breaks asunder into two factors. What was called simple force duplicates itself, and through its infinity is law. It means, b, that what is thus sundered, constituting as it does the parts which are thought of as in the law, puts itself forward as subsisting, as stable, and, if the parts are considered without the conception of internal distinction then space and time, or distance and velocity, which appear as moments of gravity, are just as much indifferent and without necessary relation to one another as to gravity itself, or again as this bare gravity is indifferent to them, or as simple electricity is. Indifferent to positive and negative. But, see. By this conception of internal distinction, this unlike and indifferent factor, space and time, etc., becomes a distinction, which is no distinction, or merely a distinction of what is self-same, and its essence is unity. They are reciprocally awakened into activity as positive and negative by each other, and their being lies rather in their putting themselves as not being, and cancelling themselves in the common unity. Both the factors distinguished subsist they are per se, and they are per se as opposites, that is are the opposites of themselves, they have their antithesis within them, and are merely one single unity. This bare and simple infinity, or the absolute notion, may be called the ultimate nature of life, the soul of the world, the universal life blood, which courses everywhere, and whose flow is neither disturbed nor checked by any obstructing distinction, but is itself every distinction that arises as well as that into which all distinctions are dissolved, pulsating within itself, but ever motionless, shaken to its depths, but still at rest. It is self-identical, for the distinctions are tautological, they are distinctions that are none. This self-identical reality stands, therefore, in relation solely to itself. To itself, which means this is another, to which the relation points, and relation to itself is more strictly, breaking asunder, 
in other words, that very self-identity is internal distinction. These sundered factors have, hence, each a separate being of their own, each is an opposite of another, and thus with each the other is therein ipso facto expressly given, or it is not the opposite of another, but only the pure opposite, and thus each is, therefore, in itself the opposite of itself. Or, again, each is not an opposite at all, but exists purely for itself, a pure self-identical reality, with no distinction in it. This being so, we do not need to ask, still less to treat anxiety over such a question as philosophy or even regard this as a question philosophy cannot answer how distinction or otherness is to come out of this pure essence, how these are to be really got out of it. For the process of disruption has already taken place, distinction has been excluded from the self-identical entity, and put on one side so far as it is concerned, what was to have been the self-identical is thus already one of the sundered elements, instead of being the absolute essential reality. That the self-identical breaks asunder means, therefore, just as truly that it supersedes itself as already sundered, that it cancels itself qua otherness. The unity which people usually have in mind when they say distinction cannot come out of unity, is, in point of fact, itself merely one moment of the process of disruption, it is the abstraction of simplicity, which stands in contrast with distinction. But in that it is abstraction, is merely one of the two opposed elements, the statement thus already implies that the unity is the process of breaking asunder, for if the unity is a negative element, an opposite, then it is put forward precisely as that which contains opposition within it. The different aspects of diremption and of becoming self-identical are therefore likewise merely this process of self-cancelling. For since the self-identical element, which should first divide itself asunder or pass into its opposite, is an abstraction, to wit, is already itself a sundered element, its diremption is a cancelling of what it is, and thus the cancelling of its being sundered. The process of becoming self-identical is likewise a process of diremption, what becomes identical with itself thereby opposes itself to disruption, that is, itself thereby puts itself on one side, in other words, it becomes really something sundered. Infinitude, this absolute unrest of pure self-movement, such that whatever is determined in any way, for example, as being, is really the opposite of this determinateness has from the start been no doubt the very soul of all that has gone before, but it is in the inner world that it has first come out explicitly and definitely. The world of appearance, or the play of forces, already shows its operation, but it is in the first instance as explanation that it comes openly forward. And since it is at length an object for consciousness, and consciousness is aware of it as what it is, Consciousness is in this way self-consciousness. Understanding's function of explaining furnishes in the first instance merely the description of what self-consciousness is. Understanding cancels the distinctions present in law, distinctions which have already become pure distinctions but are still indifferent, and puts them inside a single unity, force. This identification, however, is at the same time and immediately a process of diremption for understanding removes the distinctions and sets up the oneness of force only by the fact that it creates a new distinction of force and law, which at the same time, however, is no distinction. And moreover in that this distinction is at the same time no distinction, it proceeds further and cancels this distinction again, since it lets force have just the same constitution as law. This process or necessity is, however, in this form still a necessity in a process of understanding, or the process as such is not the object of understanding, instead, understanding has as its objects in that process positive and negative electricity, distance, velocity, force of attraction, and a thousand other things objects which make up the content of the moments of the process. It is just for that reason that there is so much satisfaction in explanation, because consciousness being there, if we may use such an expression, in direct communion with itself, enjoys itself only. No doubt it there seems to be occupied with something else, but in point of fact it is busied all the while merely with itself. In the opposite law, 
as the inversion of the first law, or in internal distinction, infinitude doubtless becomes itself object of understanding. But once more understanding fails to do justice to infinity as such, since understanding assigns again to two worlds, or to two substantial elements, that which is distinction per se the self-repulsion of the selfsame, and the self-attraction of unlike factors. To understanding the process, as it is found in experience, is here an event that happens, and the selfsame and the unlike are predicates, whose reality is an underlying substratum. What is for understanding an object in a covering veil of sense, now comes before us in its essential form as a pure notion. This apprehension of distinction as it truly is, the apprehension of infinitude as such, is something for us observing the course of the process, or is implicit, imminent. The exposition of its notion belongs to science. Consciousness, however, in the way it immediately has this notion, again appears as a peculiar form or new attitude of consciousness, which does not recognize its own essential nature in what has gone before, but looks upon it as something quite different. In that this notion of infinitude is its object, it is thus a consciousness of the distinction as one which at the same time is at once cancelled. Consciousness is for itself and on its own account, it is a distinguishing of what is undistinguished, it is self-consciousness. I distinguish myself from myself, and therein I am immediately aware that this factor distinguished from me is not distinguished. I, the self-same being, thrust myself away from myself, but this which is distinguished, which is set up as unlike me, is immediately on its being distinguished no distinction for me. Consciousness of another, of an object in general, is indeed itself necessarily self-consciousness, reflectedness into self, consciousness of self in its otherness. The necessary advance from the previous attitudes of consciousness, which found their true content to be a thing, something other than themselves, brings to light this very fact that not merely is consciousness of a thing only possible for a self-consciousness, but that this self-consciousness alone is the truth of those attitudes. But it is only for us, who trace this process that this truth is actually present, it is not yet so for the consciousness immersed in the experience. Self-consciousness has in the first instance become a specific reality on its own account, has come into being for itself, it is not yet in the form of unity with consciousness in general. We see that in the inner being of the sphere of appearance, understanding gets to know in truth nothing else but appearance itself, not, however, appearance in the shape of a play of forces, but that play of forces in its absolutely universal moments and in the process of those moments, in fact, understanding merely experiences itself. Raised above perception, consciousness reveals itself united and bound up with the supersensible world through the mediating agency of the realm of appearance, through which it gazes into this background that lies behind appearance. The two extremes, the one that of the pure inner region, the other that of the inner being gazing into this pure inner region, are now merged together, and as they have disappeared qua extremes, the middle term, the mediating agency, qua something other than these extremes, has also vanished. This curtain of appearance, therefore, hanging before the inner world is withdrawn, and we have here the inner being, the ego gazing into the inner realm, the vision of the undistinguished self-same reality, which repels itself from itself, affirms itself as a divided and distinguished inner reality, but as one for which at the same time the two factors have immediately no distinction, what we have here is self-consciousness. It is manifest that behind the so-called curtain, which is to hide the inner world, there is nothing to be seen unless we ourselves go behind there, as much in order that we may thereby see, as that there may be something behind there which can be seen. But it is clear at the same time that we cannot without more ado go straightway behind there. For this knowledge of what is the truth of the idea of the realm of appearance and of its inner being, is itself only a result arrived at after a long and devious process, in the course of which the modes of consciousness, meaning, perception, and understanding disappear. And it will be equally evident that to get acquainted with what consciousness knows when it is knowing itself, requires us to fetch a still wider compass, what follows will set this forth at length.
Part B. Self-Consciousness. Section 4. The Truth Which Conscious Certainty of Self Realizes. Translator's Comments, The analysis of experience up to this point has been occupied with the relation of consciousness to an object admittedly different in nature from the mind aware of it. This external opposition, however, breaks down under analysis, and we are left with the result that consciousness does and must find itself in unity with its object, a unity which implies identity of nature between consciousness and its object, consciousness becomes certain of itself in its object. This is not merely a result, but the truest expression of the initial relation with which experience starts. It is, therefore, the ground of the possibility of any relation between the terms in question, consciousness of self is the basis of the consciousness of anything whatsoever. This is Hegel's reinterpretation of the Kantian analysis of experience. But this result is, again, really the starting point for a further analysis of experience, but of experience at a higher level of realization. Consciousness of self is to begin with a general attitude, a definite type of experience, which requires elucidation. It has its own conditions and forms of manifestation. Self-consciousness, being supreme, must realize itself in relation to nature, to other selves similar to the self, and to the ultimate being of the world. These are different kinds of content with which consciousness is to find its oneness, and they furnish different forms in which the same principle is manifested. The argument seeks to show that these forms are also different degrees of realization of self-consciousness. The outcome of the argument is that self-consciousness is truly realized only when it is universal self-consciousness, when consciousness is certain of itself throughout all reality, and explicitly finds there only itself. This result takes the form, as we shall see, of what is called reason. End of translator's comments. The immediately succeeding section takes up the first stage of the development of self-consciousness, the consciousness of self in relation to nature. This takes the shape of desire, instinct, impulse, etc., and involves the category of life. This relationship, while undoubtedly implying the sense of self in the object and consciousness of unity with it, is the least satisfying and the least complete of all the modes of self-consciousness. It points the way, therefore, to the fuller sense of self obtained when the self is aware of itself in relation to another self. The truth which conscious certainty of self realizes. In the kinds of certainty hitherto considered, the truth for consciousness is something other than consciousness itself. The conception, however, of this truth vanishes in the course of our experience of it. What the object immediately was in itself, whether mere being in sense certainty, a concrete thing in perception, or force in the case of understanding it turns out, in truth, not to be this really, but instead, this inherent nature proves to be a way in which it is for another. The abstract conception of the object gives way before the actual concrete object, or the first immediate idea is cancelled in the course of experience. Mere certainty vanished in favor of the truth. There has now arisen, however, what was not established in the case of these previous relationships, in other words, a certainty which is on a par with its truth, for the certainty is to itself its own object, and consciousness is to itself the truth. Otherness, no doubt, is also found there, consciousness, that is, makes a distinction, but what is distinguished is of such a kind that consciousness, at the same time, holds there is no distinction made. If we call the movement of knowledge conception, and knowledge, qua simple unity or ego, the object, we see that not only for us tracing the process, but likewise for knowledge itself, the object corresponds to the conception, or, if we put it in the other form and call conception what the object is in itself, while applying the term object to what the object is qua object or for another, it is clear that being in itself and being for another are here the same. For the inherent being is consciousness, yet it is still just as much that for which another, in other words, what is in itself, is. And it is for consciousness that the inherent nature of the object, and its being for another are one and the same. 
Ego is the content of the relation, and itself the process of relating. It is ego itself which is opposed to another and, at the same time, reaches out beyond this other, which other is all the same taken to be only itself. With self-consciousness, then, we have now passed into the native land of truth, into that kingdom where it is at home. We have to see how the form or attitude of self-consciousness in the first instance appears. When we consider this new form and type of knowledge, the knowledge of self, in its relation to that which preceded, namely, the knowledge of another, we find, indeed, that this latter has vanished, but that its moments have, at the same time, been preserved, and the loss consists in this, that those moments are here present as they are implicitly, as they are in themselves. The being which meaning dealt with, particularity and the universality of perception opposed to it, as also the empty, inner region of understanding these are no longer present as substantial elements, but as moments of self-consciousness, to wit, as abstractions or differences, which are, at the same time, of no account for consciousness itself, or are not differences at all, and are purely vanishing entities. What seems to have been lost, then, is only the principal moment, in other words, the simple fact of having independent subsistence for consciousness. But, in reality, self-consciousness is reflection out of the bare being that belongs to the world of sense and perception, and is essentially the return out of otherness. As self-consciousness, it is movement. But when it distinguishes only itself as such from itself, distinction is straightway taken to be superseded in the sense of involving otherness. The distinction is not, and self-consciousness is only motionless tautology, ego is ego, I am I. When for self-consciousness the distinction does not also have the shape of being, it is not self-consciousness. For self-consciousness, then, otherness is a fact, it does exist as a distinct moment, but the unity of itself with this difference is also a fact for self-consciousness, and is a second distinct moment. With that first moment, self-consciousness occupies the position of consciousness, and the whole expanse of the world of sense is conserved as its object, but at the same time only as related to the second moment, the unity of self-consciousness with itself. And, consequently, the sensible world is regarded by self-consciousness as having a subsistence which is, however, only appearance, or forms a distinction from self-consciousness that per se has no being. This opposition of its appearance and its truth finds its real essence, however, only in the truth in the unity of self-consciousness with itself. This unity must become essential to self-consciousness, to wit, self-consciousness is the state of desire in general. Consciousness has, qua self-consciousness, henceforth a twofold object the one immediate, the object of sense certainty and of perception, which, however, is here found to be marked by the character of negation, the second, in other words, itself, which is the true essence, and is found in the first instance only in the opposition of the first object to it. Self-consciousness presents itself here as the process in which this opposition is removed, and oneness or identity with itself established. For us or implicitly, the object, which is the negative element for self-consciousness, has on its side returned into itself, just as on the other side consciousness has done. Through this reflection into self, the object has become life. What self-consciousness distinguishes as having a being distinct from itself, has in it too, so far as it is affirmed to be, not merely the aspect of sense certainty and perception, it is a being reflected into itself, and the object of immediate desire is something living. For the inherent reality, the general result of the relation of the understanding to the inner nature of things, is the distinguishing of what cannot be distinguished, or is the unity of what is distinguished. This unity, however, is, as we saw, just as much its recoil from itself, and this conception breaks asunder into the opposition of self-consciousness and life, the former is the unity for which the absolute unity of differences exists, the latter, however, is only this unity itself, so that the unity is not at the same time for itself. Thus, 
according to the independence possessed by consciousness, is the independence which its object in itself possesses. Self-consciousness, which is absolutely for itself, and characterizes its object directly as negative, or is primarily desire, will really, therefore, find through experience this object's independence. The determination of the principle of life as obtained from the conception or general result with which we enter this new sphere, is sufficient to characterize it, without its nature being evolved further out of that notion. Its circuit is completed in the following moments. The essential element is infinitude as the supersession of all distinctions, the pure rotation on its own axis, itself at rest while being absolutely restless infinitude, the very self-dependence in which the differences brought out in the process are all dissolved, the simple reality of time, which in this self-identity has the solid form and shape of space. The differences, however, all the same hold as differences in this simple universal medium, for this universal flux exercises its negative activity merely in that it is the sublation of them, but it could not transcend them unless they had a subsistence of their own. Precisely this flux is itself, as self-identical independence, their subsistence or their substance, in which they accordingly are distinct members, parts which have being in their own right. Being no longer has the significance of mere abstract being, nor has their naked essence the meaning of abstract universality, their being now is just that simple fluent substance of the pure movement within itself. The difference, however, of these members in ter se consists, in general, in no other characteristic than that of the moments of infinitude, or of the mere movement itself. The independent members exist for themselves. To be thus for themselves, however, is really as much their reflection directly into the unity, as this unity is the breaking asunder into independent forms. The unity is sundered because it is absolutely negative or infinite unity, and because it is subsistence, difference likewise has independence only in it. This independence of the form appears as a determinate entity, as what is for another, for the form is something disunited, and the cancelling of diremption takes effect to that extent through another. But this sublation lies just as much in the actual form itself. For just that flux is the substance of the independent forms. This substance, however, is infinite, and hence the form itself in its very subsistence involves diremption, or sublation of its existence for itself. If we distinguish more exactly the moments contained here, we see that we have as first moment the subsistence of the independent forms, or the suppression of what distinction inherently involves, in other words, that the forms have no being per se, and no subsistence. The second moment, however, is the subjection of that subsistence to the infinitude of distinction. In the first moment there is the subsisting, persisting mode or form, by its being in its own right, or by its being in its determinate shape an infinite substance, it comes forward in opposition to the universal substance, disowns this fluent continuity with that substance, and insists that it is not dissolved in this universal element, but rather on the contrary preserves itself by and through its separation from this its inorganic nature, and by the fact that it consumes this inorganic nature. Life in the universal fluid medium, quietly, silently shaping and molding and distributing the forms in all their manifold detail, becomes by that very activity the movement of those forms, or passes into life qua process. The mere universal flux is here the inherent being, the outer being, the other, is the distinction of the forms assumed. But this flux, this fluent condition, becomes itself the other in virtue of this very distinction, because now it exists for or am relation to that distinction, which is self-conditioned and self-contained and consequently is the endless, infinite movement by which that stable medium is consumed is life as living. This inversion of character, however, is on that account again invertedness in itself as such. What is consumed is the essential reality, the individuality, which preserves itself at the expense of the universal and gives itself the feeling of its unity with itself, precisely thereby cancels its contrast with the other by means of which it exists for itself. The unity with self, which it gives itself, 
is just the fluent continuity of differences, or universal dissolution. But, conversely, the cancelling of individual subsistence at the same time produces the subsistence. For since the essence of the individual form universal life and the self-existent entity per se are simple substance, the essence, by putting the other within itself, cancels this its own simplicity or its essence, to wit, it sunders that simplicity, and this disruption of fluent undifferentiated continuity is just the setting up, the affirmation, of individuality. The simple substance of life, therefore, is the diremption of itself into shapes and forms, and at the same time the dissolution of these substantial differences, and the resolution of this diremption is just as much a process of diremption, of articulating. Thus, both the sides of the entire movement which were before distinguished, in other words, the setting up of individual forms lying apart and undisturbed in the universal medium of independent existence, and the process of life collapse into one another. The latter is just as much a formation of independent individual shapes, as it is a way of cancelling a shape assumed, and the former, the setting up of individual forms, is as much a cancelling as an articulation of them. The fluent, continuous element is itself only the abstraction of the essential reality, or it is actual only as a definite shape or form, and that it articulates itself is once more a breaking up of the articulated form, or a dissolution of it. The entire circuit of this activity constitutes life. It is neither what is expressed to begin with, the immediate continuity and concrete solidity of its essential nature, nor the stable, subsisting form, the discrete individual which exists on its own account, nor the bare process of this form, nor again is it the simple combination of all these moments. It is none of these, it is the whole which develops itself, resolves its own development, and in this movement simply preserves itself. Since we started from the first immediate unity, and returned through the moments of form determination, and of process, to the unity of both these moments, and thus again back to the first simple substance, we see that this reflected unity is other than the first. As opposed to that immediate unity, the unity expressed as a mode of being, this second is the universal unity, which holds all these moments sublated within itself. It is the simple genus, which in the movement of life itself does not exist in this simplicity for itself, but in this result points life towards what is other than itself, namely, towards consciousness for which life exists as this unity or as genus. This other life, however, for which the genus as such exists and which is genus for itself, namely, self-consciousness, exists in the first instance only in the form of this simple, essential reality, and has for object itself qua pure ego. In the course of its experience, which we are now to consider, this abstract object will grow in richness, and will be unfolded in the way we have seen in the case of life. The simple ego is this genus, or the bare universal, for which the differences are insubstantial, only by its being the negative essence of the moments which have assumed a definite and independent form. And self-consciousness is thus only assured of itself through sublating this other, which is presented to self-consciousness as an independent life, self-consciousness is desire. Convinced of the nothingness of this other, it definitely affirms this nothingness to be for itself the truth of this other, negates the independent object, and thereby acquires the certainty of its own self, as true certainty, a certainty which it has become aware of in objective form. In this state of satisfaction, however, it has experience of the independence of its object. Desire and the certainty of its self obtained in the gratification of desire, are conditioned by the object, for the certainty exists through cancelling this other, in order that this cancelling may be effected, there must be this other. Self-consciousness is thus unable by its negative relation to the object to abolish it, because of that relation it rather produces it again, as well as the desire. The object desired is, in fact, something other than self-consciousness, the essence of desire, and through this experience this truth has become realized. At the same time, however, self-consciousness is likewise absolutely for itself, exists on its own account, and it is so only by sublation of the object, 
and it must come to feel its satisfaction, for it is the truth. On account of the independence of the object, therefore, it can only attain satisfaction when this object itself effectually brings about negation within itself. The object must per se affect this negation of itself, for it is inherently something negative, and must be for the other what it is. Since the object is in its very self negation, and in being so is at the same time independent, it is consciousness. In the case of life, which is the object of desire, the negation either lies in another, namely, in desire, or takes the form of determinateness standing in opposition to another external individuum indifferent to it, or appears as its inorganic general nature. The above general independent nature, however, in the case of which negation takes the form of absolute negation, is the genus as such or as self-consciousness. Self-consciousness attains its satisfaction only in another self-consciousness. It is in these three moments that the notion of self-consciousness first gets completed, a, pure undifferentiated ego is its first immediate object. b, this immediacy is itself, however, thoroughgoing mediation, it has its being only by cancelling the independent object, in other words it is desire. The satisfaction of desire is indeed the reflection of self-consciousness into itself, is the certainty which has passed into objective truth. But, see, the truth of this certainty is really twofold reflection, the reduplication of self-consciousness. Consciousness has an object which implicates its own otherness or affirms distinction as a void distinction, and therein is independent. The individual form distinguished, which is only a living form, certainly cancels its independence also in the process of life itself, but it ceases along with its distinctive difference to be what it is. The object of self-consciousness, however, is still independent in this negativity of itself, and thus it is for itself genus, universal flux, or continuity in the very distinctiveness of its own separate existence, it is a living self-consciousness. A self-consciousness has before it a self-consciousness. Only so and only then is it self-consciousness in actual fact, for here first of all it comes to have the unity of itself in its otherness. Ego, which is the object of its notion, is in point of fact not object. The object of desire, however, is only independent, for it is the universal, ineradicable substance, the fluent self-identical essential reality. When a self-consciousness is the object, the object is just as much ego as object. With this we already have before us the notion of mind or spirit. What consciousness has further to become aware of, is the experience of what mind is this absolute substance, which is the unity of the different self-related and self-existent self-consciousnesses in the perfect freedom and independence of their opposition as component elements of that substance, ego that is we, a plurality of egos, and we that is a single ego. Consciousness first finds in self-consciousness the notion of mind its turning point, where it leaves the party-colored show of the sensuous immediate, passes from the dark void of the transcendent and remote supersensuous, and steps into the spiritual daylight of the present. Part A. Independence and Dependence of Self-Consciousness Lordship and Bondage Translator's Comments, The selves conscious of self in another self are, of course, distinct and separate from each other. The difference is, in the first instance, a question of degree of self-assertion and self-maintenance, one is stronger, higher, more independent than another, and capable of asserting this at the expense of the other. Still, even this distinction of primary and secondary rests ultimately on their identity of constitution, and the course of the analysis here gradually brings out this essential identity as the true fact. The equality of the selves is the truth, or completer realization, of self in another self, the affinity is higher and more ultimate than the disparity. Still, the struggle and conflict of selves must be gone through in order to bring out this result. Hence the present section. The background of Hegel's thought is the remarkable human phenomenon of the subordination of oneself to another which we have in all forms of servitude whether slavery, serfdom, or voluntary service. Servitude is not, 
only a phase of human history, it is in principle a condition of the development and maintenance of the consciousness of self as a fact of experience. End of translator's comments. Lordship and bondage. Self-consciousness exists in itself and for itself, in that, and by the fact that it exists for another self-consciousness, that is to say, it is only by being acknowledged or recognized. The conception of this its unity in its duplication, of infinitude realizing itself in self-consciousness, has many sides to it and encloses within it elements of varied significance. Thus its moments must on the one hand be strictly kept apart in detailed distinctiveness, and, on the other, in this distinction must, at the same time, also be taken as not distinguished, or must always be accepted and understood in their opposite sense. This double meaning of what is distinguished lies in the nature of self-consciousness, of its being infinite, or directly the opposite of the determinateness in which it is fixed. The detailed exposition of the notion of this spiritual unity in its duplication will bring before us the process of recognition. Self-consciousness has before it another self-consciousness, it has come outside itself. This has a double significance. First it has lost its own self, since it finds itself as another being, secondly, it has thereby sublated that other, for it does not regard the other as essentially real, but sees its own self in the other. It must cancel this its other. To do so is the sublation of that first double meaning, and is therefore a second double meaning. First, it must set itself to sublate the other independent being, in order thereby to become certain of itself as true being, secondly, it thereupon proceeds to sublate its own self, for this other is itself. This sublation in a double sense of its otherness in a double sense is at the same time a return in a double sense into itself. For, firstly, through sublation, it gets back itself, because it becomes one with itself again through the cancelling of its otherness, but secondly, it likewise gives otherness back again to the other self-consciousness, for it was aware of being in the other, it cancels this its own being in the other and thus lets the other again go free. This process of self-consciousness in relation to another self-consciousness has in this manner been represented as the action of one alone. But this action on the part of the one has itself the double significance of being at once its own action and the action of that other as well. For the other is likewise independent, shut up within itself, and there is nothing in it which is not there through itself. The first does not have the object before it only in the passive form characteristic primarily of the object of desire, but as an object existing independently for itself, over which therefore it has no power to do anything for its own behalf, if that object does not per se do what the first does to it. The process then is absolutely the double process of both self-consciousnesses. Each sees the other do the same as itself, each itself does what it demands on the part of the other, and for that reason does what it does, only so far as the other does the same. Action from one side only would be useless, because what is to happen can only be brought about by means of both. The action has then a double entente not only in the sense that it is an act done to itself as well as to the other, but also in the sense that the act simpliciter is the act of the one as well as of the other regardless of their distinction. In this movement we see the process repeated which came before us as the play of forces, in the present case, however, it is found in consciousness. What in the former had effect only for us contemplating experience, holds here for the terms themselves. The middle term is self-consciousness which breaks itself up into the extremes, and each extreme is this interchange of its own determinateness, and complete transition into the opposite. While qua consciousness, it no doubt comes outside itself, still, in being outside itself, it is at the same time restrained within itself, it exists for itself, and its self-externalization is for consciousness. Consciousness finds that it immediately is and is not another consciousness, as also that this other is for itself only when it cancels itself as existing for itself, and has self-existence only in the self-existence of the other. Each is the mediating term to the other, through which each mediates and unites itself with itself, 
and each is to itself and to the other an immediate self-existing reality, which, at the same time, exists thus for itself only through this mediation. They recognize themselves as mutually recognizing one another. This pure conception of recognition, of duplication of self-consciousness within its unity, we must now consider in the way its process appears for self-consciousness. It will, in the first place, present the aspect of the disparity of the two, or the breakup of the middle term into the extremes, which, qua extremes, are opposed to one another, and of which one is merely recognized, while the other only recognizes. Self-consciousness is primarily simple existence for self, self-identity by exclusion of every other from itself. It takes its essential nature and absolute object to be ego, and in this immediacy, in this bare fact of its self-existence, it is individual. That which for it is other stands as unessential object, as object with the impress and character of negation. But the other is also a self-consciousness, an individual makes its appearance an antithesis to an individual. Appearing thus in their immediacy, they are for each other in the manner of ordinary objects. They are independent individual forms, modes of consciousness that have not risen above the bare level of life, for the existent object here has been determined as life. They are, moreover, forms of consciousness which have not yet accomplished for one another the process of absolute abstraction, of uprooting all immediate existence, and of being merely the bare, negative fact of self-identical consciousness, or, in other words, have not yet revealed themselves to each other as existing purely for themselves, to wit, as self-consciousness. Each is indeed certain of its own self, but not of the other, and hence its own certainty of itself is still without truth. For its truth would be merely that its own individual existence for itself would be shown to it to be an independent object, or, which is the same thing, that the object would be exhibited as this pure certainty of itself. By the notion of recognition, however, this is not possible, except in the form that as the other is for it, so it is for the other, each in itself through its own action and again through the action of the other achieves this pure abstraction of existence for self. The presentation of itself, however, as pure abstraction of self-consciousness consists in showing itself as a pure negation of its objective form, or in showing that it is fettered to no determinate existence, that it is not bound at all by the particularity everywhere characteristic of existence as such, and is not tied up with life. The process of bringing all this out involves a twofold action action on the part of the other and action on the part of itself. In so far as it is the other's action, each aims at the destruction and death of the other. But in this there is implicated also the second kind of action, self-activity, for the former implies that it risks its own life. The relation of both self-consciousnesses is in this way so constituted that they prove themselves and each other through a life and death struggle. They must enter into this struggle, for they must bring their certainty of themselves, the certainty of being for themselves, to the level of objective truth, and make this a fact both in the case of the other and in their own case as well. And it is solely by risking life that freedom is obtained, only thus is it tried and proved that the essential nature of self-consciousness is not bare existence, is not the merely immediate form in which it at first makes its appearance, is not its mere absorption in the expanse of life. Rather, it is thereby guaranteed that there is nothing present but what might be taken as a vanishing moment that self-consciousness is merely pure self-existence, being for self. The individual, who has not staked his life, may, no doubt, be recognized as a person, but he has not attained the truth of this recognition as an independent self-consciousness. In the same way, each must aim at the death of the other, as it risks its own life thereby for that other is to it of no more worth than itself the other's reality is presented to the former as an external other, as outside itself, it must cancel that externality. The other is a purely existent consciousness and entangled in manifold ways, it must view its otherness as pure existence for itself or as absolute negation. This trial by death, however, cancels both the truth which was to result from it, and therewith the certainty of self altogether.
for just as life is the natural position consciousness, independence without absolute negativity, so death is the natural negation of consciousness, negation without independence, which thus remains without the requisite significance of actual recognition. Through death, doubtless, there has arisen the certainty that both did stake their life, and held it lightly both in their own case and in the case of the other, but that is not for those who underwent this struggle. They cancel their consciousness which had its place in this alien element of natural existence, in other words, they cancel themselves and are sublated as terms or extremes seeking to have existence on their own account. But along with this there vanishes from the play of change the essential moment, in other words, that of breaking up into extremes with opposite characteristics, and the middle term collapses into a lifeless unity which is broken up into lifeless extremes, merely existent and not opposed. And the two do not mutually give and receive one another back from each other through consciousness, they let one another go quite indifferently, like things. Their act is abstract negation, not the negation characteristic of consciousness, which cancels in such a way that it preserves and maintains what is sublated, and thereby survives its being sublated. In this experience self-consciousness becomes aware that life is as essential to it as pure self-consciousness. In immediate self-consciousness the simple ego is absolute object, which, however, is for us or in itself absolute mediation, and has as its essential moment substantial and solid independence. The dissolution of that simple unity is the result of the first experience, through this there is posited a pure self-consciousness, and a consciousness which is not purely for itself, but for another, to wit, as an existent consciousness, consciousness in the form and shape of thinghood. Both moments are essential, since, in the first instance, they are unlike and opposed, and their reflection into unity has not yet come to light, they stand as two opposed forms or modes of consciousness. The one is independent, and its essential nature is to be for itself, the other is dependent, and its essence is life or existence for another. The former is the master, or lord, the latter the bondsman. The master is the consciousness that exists for itself, but no longer merely the general notion of existence for self. Rather, it is a consciousness existing on its own account which is mediated with itself through another consciousness, to wit, through another whose very nature implies that it is bound up with an independent being or with thinghood in general. The master brings himself into relation to both these moments, to a thing as such, the object of desire, and to the consciousness whose essential character is thinghood. And since the master, is, a, qua notion of self-consciousness, an immediate relation of self-existence, but, b, is now moreover at the same time mediation, or a being for self which is for itself only through another he the master stands in relation, a, immediately to both, b, immediately to each through the other. The master relates himself to the bondsman immediately through independent existence, for that is precisely what keeps the bondsman in thrall, it is his chain, from which he could not in the struggle get away, and for that reason lie proved himself to be dependent, to have his independence in the shape of thinghood. The master, however, is the power controlling this state of existence, for he has shown in the struggle that lie holds it to be merely something negative. Since he is the power dominating existence, while this existence again is the power controlling the other the bondsman, the master holds, par consequence, this other in subordination. In the same way the master relates himself to the thing immediately through the bondsman. The bondsman being a self-consciousness in the broad sense, also takes up a negative attitude to things and cancels them, but the thing is, at the same time, independent for him and, in consequence, he cannot, with all his negating, get so far as to annihilate it outright and be done with it, that is to say, lie merely works on it. To the master, on the other hand, by means of this mediating process, belongs the immediate relation, in the sense of the pure negation of it, in other words he gets the enjoyment. What mere desire did not attain, he now succeeds in attaining, in other words, to have done with the thing, and find satisfaction in enjoyment.
Desire alone did not get the length of this, because of the independence of the thing. The master, however, who has interposed the bondsman between it and himself, thereby relates himself merely to tile dependence of the thing, and enjoys it without qualification and without reserve. The aspect of its independence he leaves to the bondsman, who labors upon it. In these two moments, the master gets his recognition through another consciousness, for in them the latter affirms itself as unessential, both by working upon the thing, and, on the other hand, by the fact of being dependent on a determinate existence, in neither case can this other get the mastery over existence, and succeed in absolutely negating it. We have thus here this moment of recognition, in other words, that the other consciousness cancels itself as self-existent, and, ipso facto, itself does what the first does to it. In the same way we have the other moment, that this action on the part of the second is the action proper of the first, for what is done by the bondsman is properly an action on the part of the master. The latter exists only for himself, that is his essential nature, he is the negative power without qualification, a power to which the thing is not. And he is thus the absolutely essential act in this situation, while the bondsman is not so, he is an unessential activity. But for recognition proper there is needed the moment that what the master does to the other he should also do to himself, and what the bondsman does to himself, he should do to the other also. On that account a form of recognition has arisen that is one-sided and unequal. In all this, the unessential consciousness is, for the master, the object which embodies the truth of his certainty of himself. But it is evident that this object does not correspond to its notion, for, just where the master has effectively achieved lordship, he really finds that something has come about quite different from an independent consciousness. It is not an independent, but rather a dependent consciousness that he has achieved. He is thus not assured of self-existence as his truth, he finds that his truth is rather the unessential consciousness, and the fortuitous unessential action of that consciousness. The truth of the independent consciousness is accordingly the consciousness of the bondsman. This doubtless appears in the first instance outside itself, and not as the truth of self-consciousness. But just as lordship showed its essential nature to be the reverse of what it wants to be, so, too, bondage will, when completed, pass into the opposite of what it immediately is, being a consciousness repressed within itself, it will enter into itself, and change round into real and true independence. We have seen what bondage is only in relation to lordship. But it is a self-consciousness, and we have now to consider what it is, in this regard, in and for itself. In the first instance, the master is taken to be the essential reality for the state of bondage, hence, for it, the truth is the independent consciousness existing for itself, although this truth is not taken yet as inherent in bondage itself. Still, it does in fact contain within itself this truth of pure negativity and self-existence, because it has experienced this reality within it. For this consciousness was not in peril and fear for this element or that, nor for this or that moment of time, it was afraid of for its entire being, it felt the fear of death, the sovereign master. It has been in that experience melted to its inmost soul, has trembled throughout its every fiber, and all that was fixed and steadfast has quaked within it. This complete perturbation of its entire substance, this absolute dissolution of all its stability into fluent continuity, is, however, the simple, ultimate nature of self-consciousness, absolute negativity, pure self-referent existence, which consequently is involved in this type of consciousness. This moment of pure self-existence is moreover a fact for it, for in the master it finds this as its object. Further, this bondsman's consciousness is not only this total dissolution in a general way, in serving and toiling the bondsman actually carries this out. By serving he cancels in every particular aspect his dependence on an attachment to natural existence, and by his work removes this existence away. The feeling of absolute power, however, realized both in general and in the particular form of service, is only dissolution implicitly 
and albeit the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, consciousness is not therein aware of being self-existent. Through work and labor, however, this consciousness of the bondsman comes to itself. In the moment which corresponds to desire in the case of the master's consciousness, the aspect of the non-essential relation to the thing seemed to fall to the lot of the servant, since the thing there retained its independence. Desire has reserved to itself the pure negating of the object and thereby unalloyed feeling of self. This satisfaction, however, just for that reason is itself only a state of evanescence, for it lacks objectivity or subsistence. Labor, on the other hand, is desire restrained and checked, evanescence delayed and postponed, in other words, labor shapes and fashions the thing. The negative relation to the object passes into the form of the object, into something that is permanent and remains, because it is just for the laborer that the object has independence. This negative mediating agency, this activity giving shape and form, is at the same time the individual existence, the pure self-existence of that consciousness, which now in the work it does is externalized and passes into the condition of permanence. The consciousness that toils and serves accordingly attains by this means the direct apprehension of that independent being as itself. But again, shaping or forming the object has not only the positive significance that the bondsman becomes thereby aware of himself as factually and objectively self-existent, this type of consciousness has also a negative import, in contrast with its moment, the element of fear. For in shaping the thing it only becomes aware of its own proper negativity, existence on its own account, as an object, through the fact that it cancels the actual form confronting it. But this objective negative element is precisely alien, external reality, before which it trembled. Now, however, it destroys this extraneous alien negative, affirms and sets itself up as a negative in the element of permanence, and thereby becomes for itself a self-existent being. In the master, the bondsman feels self-existence to be something external, an objective fact, in fear self-existence is present within himself, in fashioning the thing, self-existence comes to be felt explicitly as his own proper being, and he attains the consciousness that he himself exists in its own right and on its own account. By the fact that the form is objectified, it does not become something other than the consciousness molding the thing through work, for just that form is his pure self-existence, which therein becomes truly realized. Thus precisely in labor where there seemed to be merely some outsider's mind and ideas involved, the bondsman becomes aware, through this rediscovery of himself by himself, of having and being a mind of his own. For this reflection of self into self the two moments, fear and service in general, as also that of formative activity, are necessary, and at the same time both must exist in a universal manner. Without the discipline of service and obedience, fear remains formal and does not spread over the whole known reality of existence. Without the formative activity shaping the thing, fear remains inward and mute, and consciousness does not become objective for itself. Should consciousness shape and form the thing without the initial state of absolute fear, then it has a merely vain and futile mind of its own, for its form or negativity is not negativity per se, and hence its formative activity cannot furnish the consciousness of itself as essentially real. If it has endured not absolute fear, but merely some slight anxiety, the negative reality has remained external to it, its substance has not been through and through infected thereby. Since the entire content of its natural consciousness has not tottered and shaken, it is still inherently a determinate mode of being, having a mind of its own is simply stubbornness, a type of freedom which does not get beyond the attitude of bondage. As little as the pure form can become its essential nature, so little is that form, considered as extending over particulars, a universal formative activity, an absolute notion, it is rather a piece of cleverness which has mastery within a certain range, but not over the universal power nor over the entire objective reality.